Joining me today is an activist and advocate who co-founded the student-led gun control advocacy group Never Again MSD. He also helped organize the March for Our Lives nationwide student protest earlier this year. Cameron Kasky, welcome to The Rubin Report. Thanks for having me. I'm really happy that you're here for, for many reasons, uh, mostly because you strike me suddenly as someone that's trying to find some common ground these days, and, and we're gonna get into that and a whole bunch more, but uh, of course I have to mention up top, you are a survivor of the Parkland shooting in Florida. Um, before we go all into that and everything that you've been through since, just tell me a little bit about life before, because I assume you have a life before and now a new life. Well, you know, I spent most of my life as your typical little shitster who just <laughs> said whatever he wanted to, had a voice. Uh, I was always so convinced that I was right about everything. Wh whether that was nature or nurture is kind of up to interpretation. But I, I really grew up just dead set on the fact that I, I knew everything. Everything I said was right, and I was a genius. I learned the hard way recently, a little too recently, that I'm not, and that was a crazy awakening. Learning that you don't know everything in the entire world is actually an interesting experience. But one of the things that helped me a lot was doing theater. I was a big theater kid because mm -hmm. I, I had this voice. I always wanted to express myself. I was, uh, you know, I was flippantly loud all the time, and do I didn't know what to do with it. You know, I was knocking doors for Obama when I was seven. Wow. Yeah, I, I was really interested in you know being active with all that. I mean, I knew nothing. I thought that John McCain was running with Tina Fey, not Sarah Palin, <laughs> because I had really only seen the news, and I, I guess I got it mixed up. Uh, I was seven. Yeah. I, I didn't expect myself to be a policy expert, but you know, again, I I think the point is I was always really excited to to speak, and I, and I got involved with drama, and drama said, hey, you have a voice. Here's a way to use it. And you learn a lot of lessons from doing theater. Have you, have you ever done anything on stage not, in high school? Uh, not in high school. I did spend 12 years doing stand-up comedy in New York City, which is a whole other nightmare, but... Uh. <laughs> I, um, I always wanted to do stand-up, and then I tried it once. When I was seven years old, I was on a cruise with my family, and there was a kind of adults-only nightclub. It wasn't really... You were able to get in if you were younger, but I was the only person there under maybe 40. And they had an open mic, and I kept on, I kept on raising my hand to get on. And the, the host was saying, no, what the, what the, what the hell is this kid doing? Yeah. And then finally, he just caved in and was like, all right, let's let the kid get up here. And? And I walk up there, and I drop a three-minute routine. I make a joke about my dad's penis, uh, which was an interesting <laughs> experience. And the thing is, I did not know that while I was sitting alone in the front row, I, I snuck out of my room, my parents went to the club and I didn't see them. Wow. So, so I'm, uh, I'm out there, I'll send, I'll send you the, the clip privately. Yeah. I'm out there and I'm <laughs> four foot three and, and everybody's drunk, so they think I'm a riot, so I think I'm a riot, and I just kept going and going to the point where <laughs> the, the guy who was running the open mic was just st looming behind me, waiting for me to be done, but I guess he just didn't wanna grab the mic from a small child without looking kinda weird. Stand-up is probably best done once at seven years old and never again, so you're, <laughs> exactly. you're, you're, you're doing all Everybody's right. Everybody's had their 15 minutes of fame when they were seven on a cruise. Yeah, all right, so, so you were a theater kid. Um, anything else? we should know about just like high school life, like high school life for sure. a kid in 2017, 2018. Like, what's it like? I'm, I'm not that old, but I ain't <laughs> 17 anymore. Well, you know, I, high school was really fun for me. I really enjoyed it on a social level. I was a shitty student. Uh, my test scores were always good, but my grades were awful because I never bothered to do homework. I thought I was too smart and cool for that. But um, I, I liked high school a lot because I, I never really subscribed to one social circle. I kind of hung out with a lot of people you know, kids who were the stereotypical popular -y kids. You know, I was just the guy they knew that was funny. I would hang out with them sometimes. <clears throat> kids who were the stereotypical nerds. We would talk about movies and comic books, which I want to get into your comic yeah. book collection soon. <laughs> um, and but I, I'd say that my core group was the theater kids. Okay. I, lo I love my friends from drama. And um, it's really fun having a group of friends where you'll, you'll be hanging out on the weekend, shooting the shit, and then you'll get to school and either be falling in love with each other and making out on stage or killing each other on stage. You know, we just did Fiddler on the Roof and I got uh -huh. to marry one of my best friends. It was really fun. <laughs> I'm sure you're familiar. Yeah, yeah. With Fiddler. I am familiar with Fiddler. It's, it's a classic. Yeah, so, all right. So it sounds like a pretty normal childhood then, so far. 
I, I don't think someone like me can be created by a normal childhood, but it was a great childhood. I'm very happy. My parents divorced when I was 10, and I'm lucky enough to have four great parents. You know, I've got two brothers and a stepsister. It's a great group. Wow. When I, I'd like to think that, that I'm a pretty moral guy, and when I'm the shittiest person in a family, it's a great family. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, You have a stand-up comic in you, I can see it. Uh, hopefully it doesn't come out anytime soon. All right, so now bring me to that day earlier sure. this year. So. On February 14th, there was a, it, it was a regular day. It was actually a really nice day, and, and there was a period of time during the day that I always remember where I thought, today's going a little too well. Hmm. I was sitting reading John Walsh's book, uh, Tears of Rage, I believe, if you're familiar. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the title exactly, but I, I was a big fan, and, um, <coughs> and I was planning out a Valentine's Day gift for a girl that I really liked. Uh, she had a, she had an endoscopy that day, and she was uh, she was on a lot of medicine. And I was going to give her cousin some gifts for her and have her bring it to her. And I made her a card that said, "I would have brought you this myself, but I didn't have the stomach for it." Uh, and I, I printed see, out a you picture. Are a comic. I printed out a go. picture of her doctor and put it in the card and everything. <clears throat> and then I'm uh, we're in rehearsal for a musical we were doing, Yo Vikings, mm -hmm. which I'm sure nobody's ever heard of. I don't know it. And uh, I was we we had just finished up a song I was doing, and I realized, wait a second, I have to go pick up my brother. Because at Stoma Douglas School, it's out at 2.40, but the special needs kids are out at 2.10, so the parents can pick them up before the buses come. And my little brother has autism, and he's hanging out there with all of his friends in the ESE class. And by the way, the autistic scene at Stoma Douglas is awesome. Those kids are the best. Hmm. And um, Does the school specialize in that? Is it like a magnet school for kids no, with autism or anything? No, but it, it has a great program with great teachers. Mm -hmm. And I actually went back to Parkland this weekend to see them off to homecoming. And boy, let me tell you, that squad is wild. I love them. <laughs> and um, my little brother, I, I don't want to brag, is kind of the ringleader over there. Um, and, and I went to go pick him up because on days like that, when my mom was at work, I would take him to drama and he would just hang out. And he really loved it because all the girls would give him attention. Yeah. And, you know, he's... He's a bit of a cocky little bastard, <laughs> and um, and I realized it, it's maybe 2:20, let's say, and I, we're halfway through the song, and I say I forgot to pick up Holden, so we finished the song, and I asked my teacher if I could go run and pick him up. Of course, she said yes, and I'm picking up Holden, and suddenly there's a fire alarm, and and, I, and that was a little scary because we were close to pick up, and I was with the special needs kids, some of whom were in wheelchairs, mm -hmm. some of whom were not, were you know a little physically disabled. And we had to go to the parking lot where the buses would come. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh no, what if, this what if this is a real fire and I have to sit out here and make sure that nobody gets hit by a bus? There were teachers there, of course, but you know, it's a public school. There are maybe two teachers for 10, 15 students who need a lot of help. Sure. So we're out there sitting in the parking lot and there were, <coughs> there were students out there from other classes nearby who, because uh, again, this is a fire drill. There were students out there who were with us, and it was the ESE class, it was a couple of the nearby classes, and one of the kids jokingly said, it's a shooter. I said, dude, shut the fuck up. That's not cool. Because mm -hmm. how could that ever happen, right? And suddenly I see everybody running back inside, and the teacher says, get inside, get inside. And I said, oh, okay, it wasn't a real fire, and they want to get all the kids inside before the buses come. And then we're told to go in a room, and we're told to hide, get away from the window, and turn the lights off, and I say, okay, something's going on. And that experience was, was an interesting one because I was in the leadership room with a lot of the leadership students, which is a class that specializes in leadership, yeah. and they plan prom and everything, it's sort of student government. And it was also the special needs kids because it was the nearest room. And some of the students, being nonverbal does not mean you can't make noise. And some of the students were yelling and, and wailing. Fortunately, they had shadows, and, and the special needs teachers at Douglas are fantastic, and we were able to keep everybody calm, but we didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. And we were there for a couple hours. And slowly, more details began to emerge. Now, I assume you're hearing gunfire, and no. No, Douglas is a huge school, and I wasn't. Now, mind you, I, I thought I heard gunfire, but when you're to being told your school is getting shot up and you hear anything, you might think it's gunfire. Yeah. But I'm sitting there, Holden, my little brother, has no idea what's going on. And, and slowly I realized, okay, there's a shooting. I heard, and people were whispering around the room, it was maybe 20 kids in the room, people saying 50 people are dead, two people are dead, one person is dead. It, 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 there were conflicting stories. I heard conflicting stories of who, was the sh who the shooter was. I heard five different names, one of whom was somebody I knew. Somebody I knew would not pick up a weapon to harm a butterfly, mm -hmm. because that's hysteria. 
and, that, and that's natural, and I understand it. And then I saw something that was a terrible exhibit of humanity, if you ask me, <coughs> which was there was a Snapchat video going around that was that with the caption, yo, with multiple O's, my school getting shot up. Mm -hmm. And it was a video of a dead teacher. Look, if you're gonna film a, a shooting from inside a room so you can have evidence to show the police, good on you. If you're gonna film a shooting in a room and say, yo, my school getting shot up and send it to everybody you know, that's pretty awful. Yeah. And, and when you're sitting there in a room not knowing what's going on and you see videos of people you know and love deceased and the, and the only video I saw was of somebody who had, I had cared about for many years, he was a mentor in my life, you start to realize that nothing is ever gonna be the same again. Yeah, So, well, let's pause for one sec, because that we shouldn't gloss over that part where the social media component of this is so important, because you guys all grew up on this, and then you grow up hearing about school shootings all the time, and I could, I don't know who this kid is, it doesn't matter, I'm sure, I'm sure he's a perfectly fine person, or he or she, I don't even know. but it's like, you know, doing that, it's like it just, it almost feels like, oh, that's the normal thing to do, like, there's a shooting, like, Put, well, put it on Snapchat, is, you, know? you know? Several people I knew were just treating it like it was normal. I mean, not the shooting, but the fact that there was a video. And so, uh, I understand how some people might like to, not like, but you know, understand having to see that because they need to understand what's <coughs> going on. But I saw it and I said, how could you do that? This is somebody who is deceased and you're filming them to show, to send to all your friends. And that's a reflection of the social media you know, era we're in where everything that's going on, you gotta show everyone. So for how long were you actually in that room not knowing if you were gonna be okay, not knowing what was happening? I, I think it was about two hours. Um, I could look at interviews I did days after and have a much better gauge, I forget. Yeah. But I would call it around two hours. And you know, when the SWAT team broke the door down, there was the big issue that there are students who are developmentally disabled in here who might not be able to put their hands up. And fortunately, one of the only good things you'll see from Broward's handling of the shooting was the SWAT team was very understanding and was very quick to help these students, which was good. But when that glass broke and the first thing that walked into a room was a, was a rifle, how were we supposed to know that that wasn't yeah. us taking our turn? But, and I, everybody was texting their parents. Everybody, uh, the phone lines were kind of jammed because everybody in Parkland was making a call. I mean, it was Parkland. It was a city with, I don't even know how many people, but it, it, it's a small town where there's one high school. Is there one high school? There's around one high school. Yeah. And we, I mean, nobody should be equipped for this, but we weren't. Yeah, had you guys been taught at all? Like, are they teaching in high school, like what to do if this actually does happen, if a shooter sure. comes to a school? We had the discussion of having a code red drill. We had had long discussions about dealing with a shooter, but we had never participated in a code red drill. <clears throat> at least not while I was at school. I used to skip school a lot. Yeah, tell me a little bit more about uh, the makeup of Parkland, because you mentioned something interesting that's kind of like sure. a, a little liberal Par area in Parkland Florida. Parkland is a pretty liberal area. It's not you know, homogeneous when it comes to being liberal. You know, there's a lot of different perspectives, but the majority of people in Parkland are pretty <coughs> liberal and, and pretty classic liberal. And, um, and that's why you'll see a lot of the activism to come out of Stoneman Douglas was less, you know, let's, let's I don't know, I, it was very gun control related. Yeah, so let's, we'll get to that in, in a little bit because obviously so much has happened and the spotlight that has been, you know, put on you guys and everything else and, and several of you have stepped into it and I think there's there's probably good parts of that and bad parts of that. I think that's probably why you're here right now. Double-edged sword. Yeah, um, okay, so it ends, now what? Uh, you know, they, they tell you, all right, you can walk out of this room. I mean, sure. I can't well, imagine the, so the we change ran, in life. We ran with our hands up. We sat outside for a bit. Um, I was able to go on a city bus with my little brother's class to the Marriott, which is the <coughs> hotel, only hotel in Parkland. And so they weren't letting parents come? No, to... parents were coming to pick us up at the hotel. Okay. But there were a lot of different ways students got out of the school, a lot of different places they went. Some kids I know just ran, um, which is understandable. Yeah. Normally when there's a mass shooting nearby, you run. And um, my brother and I were at the Marriott Hotel and our father picked us up. It took us over an hour to get home because as I'm sure you can understand, the streets were very jammed. Yeah. I mean, after the shooting, Parkland was a no man's land. It, it, this wasn't Mad Max anarchy where everybody was wearing leather spikes, huh. but it was a no man's land. There was, it, it, it was as if 
time and, and space had been suspended. The rules of f f physics and matter didn't really exist. It was eerie. It was seven to days, at least for me, that was when that period of really surreal fear was, existed, that, that ever, nothing felt real. And um, the, the news was there. There was, you know, the most we got was somebody at the Sun Sentinel talking about our production of Fiddler on the Roof. The, um, did, did you in that period, and I'm sure it's very hard to even remember it clearly, did you have a real chance to mourn, to figure out what happened? Um, I don't know, you can maybe let me know how close you were to maybe some of the students. Because it seems like, and I think this was part of the problem with the way we deal with these things, is that we go from the incident to immediately, especially on social media, just attacking each other and destroying each other. Then you guys all get thrust into the spotlight and it's like, whoa, this would be hard on, on an adult, you know, impossibly hard. Meanwhile, you have these kids who are now out there talking about these things. These kids need to mourn, need to figure out what's going on with life and, and find some reality and decency. So I, I think that there's really no formula for recovering for, from a mass sh shooting, especially one at a school. I mean, enough have happened that they're starting to develop a precedence, which is a horrible thing, but there's really nowhere to look. You can. I could have hidden away, I could have locked myself in my room for weeks, and maybe that would have been the right thing to do. I could have, <clears throat> I didn't know what to do. And my way of coping has always been doing something. I had dealt with some tragic loss this past year, and I had, the, the, there were some really dark things that happened to people that I loved. And the way I always handled them was by doing something. I never liked to have a clear head, because while I think it's important to process your pain and deal with it, I also think that the, if, I, if something like that happens and I do nothing, I'm never gonna forgive myself. I, I had survivor guilt. Why, why should I have left that day? Yeah. There were 15 year old girls that were murdered and I made it out. And if I could have pressed a button to trade my life for theirs, it, it wouldn't have even been, hmm, well maybe I should say goodbye to people, maybe I should think about this. No, I would have broken my finger pressing it too hard. So what made me deserve life when other people who did nothing wrong, it, people more innocent, more kind than I am, didn't get to make it out. And I realized, while I'm alive, and, and one of my mentors wasn't, Scott Beagle, one of the nicest guys I've ever met, he's the reason that I'm a snarky little asshole. He, I developed that from him. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't make it out there, and, and he's somebody who changed young people's lives by making them better and making them more proud of themselves. So, so what makes me, des what, what has me, deserving of this. No. Uh, I'm not a very religious or spiritual person, so I, 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 don't, I didn't think there was some great plan that got me out of school, but I think that I had a responsibility. I had a responsibility to do right by the people we lost and to do what I thought would make the world a better place while they can't. Because there were marriages that didn't happen, there were people who would have had children and, and, and uh, that didn't get, I, I don't know, uh, it's, it's a horrible thing to think, but at the end of the day, uh, uh, lives ended and I still had mine. So I said, after this shooting, what I'm gonna do is something. And I, I, I was a, you know, I've been a big liberal most of my life and, I, and I've always been an advocate for gun control. I was a big debater of other students after the shooting in Las Vegas where I said, nobody needs these. We're, we're in a point in our society where we're advanced enough that nobody needs an assault weapon to take care of themselves, look at the, look at the, the way these guns are made, we can defend ourselves with handguns. My father has multiple in the house. He's a reserve police officer. He was Miami Shores for a while. I didn't. Uh, I instantly said the thing we can do here <clears throat> is stop folks like the shooter at my school from getting these weapons, because this is a 19-year-old who, if he had spent five minutes with a psychologist, would have been sent to a therapist, not a gun store. Yeah. Okay. So let's before we get specifically too far down the the gun road here, which obviously we're going to touch on. Okay, you guys are trying to mourn, you know, you're having survivor guilt, all of these things, I'm sure just in, in your family and your brother and everything else, just, I can't even imagine. Then the media, because I think this is, we have to hit media stuff before we get to the gun part. The media then descends. What was that like? I mean, I assume everybody and their brother was trying to reach out to all of you guys. They were putting you guys on TV. I mean, I probably even that very day. Um, what was that like for you guys? Or for you? I, you know, the whole, our whole situation with the media, whether it be anything from CNN to Fox News to Ellen, was a double-edged sword. Because on, on the one hand, there are bodies that are warm and we're out here on TV. 
And in, in retrospect, I might have done that differently. I'm not sure. On the other hand, I couldn't let this be like Sandy Hook, for example. Yeah. I couldn't let this be people coming in to film crying mothers, uh, talking about how bad these guns are and leave. I wanted to get out there and say, no, okay? This, how many of these do we need before we do something? I, don't, I didn't want people to see Parkland as a place where everybody was crying and everybody was throwing a pity party. I wanted par people to see Parkland as a place where a terrible tragedy happened and the city stood up and said, no, we're not gonna be like these other places. We are going to be a catalyst. I mean, <clears throat> before, before Stoneman Douglas, I would, sit, I would hear the word Sandy Hook in a room and everybody would get quiet and it would be weird. I couldn't have that be Stoneman Douglas. I, the, this place that was my school, I loved my school. I was a big school spirit fella. It was about to become a statistic. It was about to become that one dark thing that somebody will make a joke about or somebody will say something bad about or really anything. I, so I, I got out there and said, no. And so many people got out there and said, this cannot be another example of everybody, everybody crying. Yeah. We're not here to cry. We're here to tell you what we can do to make this a better world. Were there people, I assume parents, advisors, whoever, that were kind of guiding you through the media part of this? Because there were so many strange moments where it seemed like, look, I, I said to you right before, I don't want to make this about any specific student, especially, and I don't want to throw anyone out on the bus, but when we'd see someone like David Hogg, who obviously is very public now, uh, you know, saying things that, that didn't quite seem right or, or talking about laws and all this stuff, like going from just surviving to suddenly advocacy with almost no space in between, uh, you know, is, well, I think is the general dangerous. Idea, I think the general idea of going right to advocacy, while it might not have been our best call to immediately go to it, was these cameras are only here for so long. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't have them leave. There's that double-edged sword. Exactly. Yeah. So do we, do we wait our respectful time and then go out and advocate? Or will people not care? Mm -hmm. And at, I think I stand by advocacy. I'm not sure. <clears throat> I think on a moral level I might not, but on a but generally I think that while everybody was looking, we had to say, let's let's look at what we really want to look at here. Yeah. These like give these families their space. Were were any of you guys afraid that you were being looked at as experts suddenly where as horrific as what happened to you was, it doesn't make you an expert either in law or in guns or any of those things. Like you can very eloquently as you're doing right now. Tell me your story, tell me what you think, all of those things. But especially at the beginning, I'm sure you know way more now, you don't know everything, nobody knows everything, and they were throwing a bunch of 17-year-olds out there as if they were experts on all of these things. And I think that also added to some of the, the tumult around everything. Well, at the time, it was awesome. Yeah. I mean, I was an expert. I, I, felt, I felt phenomenal. I, I was somebody that everybody was looking to as if I as if I knew everything, and as I said before, that was what I wanted. Yeah. And and it wasn't a good feeling. I I'll be honest with you. Some things about it felt good. Most of it felt like terrible. It's interesting. You just said it's awesome, and it wasn't a good feeling, well, which I, probably sums it up, I guess. Yeah. It was awesome to me that I got to. The, the, I spent my whole life watching people talk about laws and watching people talk about politics, and now I got to say this and my word got to be respected, but every time I went out there, I thought there are people dead. And it's, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a moral qualm. Mm -hmm. Am I out here at, I'm, I'm doing this because I believe in it and I'm doing this because I don't want the world to lose people again. Uh, yeah, nobody deserves to be shot, nobody at all. Nobody who's a good person deserves to be shot. <clears throat> so, so, so I, it, was, it was difficult for me because on the one hand it was, this amazing feeling of, here's my voice, everybody's listening, let me tell you what you all need to hear. And what everybody needed to hear was, we need to pass gun laws, we, it's been enough. If, if, if people did nothing after Columbine, I would have understood, because that was supposed to be an anomaly. I'm sure you remember, mm -hmm. that was of course. a shocker. And then Stillman Douglas happened, and it was more of an another, not a whoa. Mm -hmm. so, so it felt, it, it, it felt great that people were caring. That was, the, that was what I would say was the awesome part, was that I was afraid everybody would, everybody in the country would feel helpless and cry and be done. Mm -hmm. But it was amazing to see that the country was saying, maybe there's something we can do here. Maybe we can make some change. And the thing that was awful was I was, I was going from news hits to, to memorial services. Yeah, so you've had a sort of interesting evolution about all this, and it, and it sort of leads to where we're gonna end, which is what you're doing now, which is pretty awesome. Um, 
so all right, you're part of the now you're part of the media machine. You guys are trying to figure out what can you do. I assume that's sort of how March for Our Life started. And if I'm not mistaken, it started in your house, right? Started in my bathroom. Yeah. I was um, I was <laughs> coming out of the shower. I was putting on my Ghostbusters PJs. It was a Slimer. It wasn't old school Ghostbusters. Yes, of course, oh, of course. All right. I um, we could talk about the new Ghostbusters maybe after this part. Um, <laughs> how much hate do you want to get online? <laughs> I uh, look. I'll tell you this. Everybody in that cast is incredibly talented. I, I didn't like the movie very much, but there's really nobody who was in it that I think was not is not an incredibly funny person. But anyway, I um, it Side started work, in my yeah. home, and and I got a lot of my friends together. Some uh, I called everyone who I knew was intelligent and well spoken, and was willing to put their time to grieve aside to demand action because it you know I felt like it was in some ways a public service because people are grieving and we're out here saying we're going to put that aside as, as much as I wanted to cry every day and mind you I really wanted to and I, I did a lot I knew that I had to put that aside I had to do something so I got everybody that I knew could do something too mostly my drama friends because I knew that they could speak mm -hmm. and we all got together in my house and said well, what do we do We've, we, this whole this whole country, people on both sides are all mourning together. How can we get everybody on both sides together to do something? Now, mind you, that didn't happen. <laughs> Getting people on both sides didn't really happen. Yeah, um, that we, can be a tough one. It's and it is a tough one, and it, it will always be a tough one. But it's something that needs to be done. And and uh, you know, from from my home, we were sleeping two hours a night. I would go entire days only eating one protein bar, not even realizing we were so, it was such a tornado that we were all, we all kind of forgot what it was like to be a normal person. So you come up with the idea for March for Our Lives. Now get us to that day and what was, was it supposed to be, what, what were the actual original intentions beyond let's not forget about this? Original intentions were let's get gun control passed. And I'm still a big let's get gun control pass guy, mm -hmm. and um, and th that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to say everybody out here saying we should do this. Let's get everyone together. Let's let's get a a big march together where people say, I want. I'm coming all the way out here. I'm standing out here today to demand this, and and seeing everybody together was amazing. I um, you get, getting up on the stage and seeing all those people. I, I didn't care about the being in front of them. I mean, I was a drama kid. Uh, I stood in front of people and talked for the past five years. But I saw all those people and I said, these people believe in something. Mm -hmm. the, these people are, come from different places. These people are all completely different, but they're all together because they believe in one thing. And that was magical. And I don't use the word magical very often. I think it's cliche, but that was magical. And it was, it was, an, it was amazing to see. But from the beginning of our ad advocacy to the march, it was it was a lot of personalities together, and we were able to make it through the pain we felt together. Mm -hmm. I mean, so often people said, "Well, why are you guys? You know, your school got shot up a month ago. Your school got shot up three weeks ago. Why are you smiling?" And I said, "Well, I, at least from my own personal perspective, the teacher that I was dear friends with that I lost, Scott wouldn't want me to cry." Scott would want me to do something. Scott would want me to do what I believed in. He wasn't a very political guy. He, he, after the shooting, he probably wouldn't have focused on any politics. He would have focused on getting everybody at Douglas to feel better, to laugh, to smile. But if I believed in something and I wanted to advocate for it, I knew that if he were here, he'd say, well, go do it. So the time I spent, I was sitting at his memorial and I was crying and my, I, I, was, I was in the dirt, I was all snotty, I, I tried to wipe my face with my dirty hands and I, it was what many would consider the low point in a movie when the mm -hmm. person feels like they've lost everything. And then I thought about it and if Scott yoda behind me as a ghost, which he and I used to talk about actually, <laughs> he and I used to talk about Yoda-ing, uh -huh. um, if he yoda behind me and he would say, Cameron, do something you must. He used to talk to me in Yoda voice a lot. And even, I thought we were going to get your Yoda impression there. It's not going to happen. No. Um, <laughs> somebody else has the exclusive on that one. Oh, okay, fair but, enough. Um, no, it, there were points where Scott was my teacher in fifth grade, and he, he Yoda voiced me while I was asking him a genuine question, which frustrated me a lot, uh -huh. but that's for another time. Yeah. I could do a three-hour interview on him, but he would have said do something. So, so when we were all smiling together, when we were all laughing together, it was because I knew that 
somebody that I loved would have wanted me to. And we had each other. That's the thing. If I, w if I was advocating for gun control alone, it wouldn't have worked. Not only because I couldn't have done it alone, I'm not good enough to do it alone, but also because we were each other's lifeline. When I was, when, when everything seemed awful and everything seemed like the world was this dark, terrible place, I had my friends around me to say, we got, we're here for you, we've got this together. And I was, you know, some people's shoulder, many people were my shoulder. I'm more emotional than many, I'm a theater student, so more people had to help me than I need to help them. Yeah. And so, so beyond the emotional part, and getting everybody together, and as you said, you're still a gun control advocate and all that. I sense that part of what happened around March for Our Lives was you saw things getting bizarrely political, or, or more than what perhaps you or you guys wanted, is that fair to say? I think what March for Our Lives should have- It's, it's a political issue, I think, the, I think the way it should have come off, and I think this is what everybody I worked with believes, I know it for a fact, is that we're kids who <clears> don't want to get shot. That's what we are at the end of the day. We are kids who are out here saying we don't want to die. And back then I thought that if you didn't believe in my gun control beliefs, you didn't care if kids died. I learned that that's not the case. But that, just, that's a pretty interesting evolution for someone at 17 to have within you know, five I, or six months. Well, I, I spoke to people who disagreed with me. I learned that they want the country to be a better place. You know, that, that they, we might not agree on how. We might think, I might think that their views are horse shit, but Every, we all agree on basically 90% of things. You know, I'm sure there are plenty of political things you and I will disagree on, but at the end of the day, Todd McFarlane is one of the most gifted Spider-Man writers we of all time. We do agree on that, do, yes. Did you ever do anything with DC? I'm more of a Marvel guy, but I, I had a pretty good Batman collection for a while. Nightwing is my favorite superhero, oh, yeah? I don't know if you're familiar. Yeah, yeah, I think, I, he's, you think, I think in comic books they're very afraid to make real change, and Nightwing actually was able to make it through that. You know, if a, if a Robin became his own superhero, normally that would only be for 10 issues, and then he'd go back, but Nightwing actually made that jump. I encourage you all to read. <laughs> but anyway, going back. We, we can focus yeah. on McFarlane Spider-Man from 298 to 335. That, I mean, the just, idea of Venom is brilliant. Yeah, but, yeah. And I saw the trailer for the movie. We'll talk about that <laughs> off camera. Um, <laughs> that sounds good. Tom Hardy's gifted. So, so the, way, the way people should have seen us and the way I failed really in the messaging because I was so deeply involved with it was we just don't want to get killed. And quickly, because of that, the perfect storm of everything, it became left versus right. And, and I don't think anybody in my group wanted that. I, I don't think anybody in my group wants that at all. But it's in one way the media's, the media's portrayal, it's in one way my personal inability to express it correctly, and in another way my arrogance, because I was pretty arrogant. I, I, mean that, you know, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I mean, everybody else I worked with in March for Our Lives was a, a kid who wanted to help the world but I was a cocky little son of a bitch. And that, and that translated a lot because I said, I'm right, that's the thing, mm -hmm. I'm right. Everything I say about gun control is completely right. So, so wh why, don't, why aren't you listening to me? Because I'm, I'm obviously in the right here. I, everybody else, again, was, was basically saying, I don't wanna die, here's how I think it could work. But I said, I'm right politically, this is my political movement, listen to my politics. That's my fault, and that's okay, I don't blame myself. I was a kid who lost friends, and I thought that this is what we needed, and I still do. But the, my, my big error, my, what, what's, the, what's the word from a tragic hero that's their flaw, Hamartia, hubris? Well, this is your hubris, I suppose. It, uh, it, let's call it the hubris. I, again, I didn't take AP Lang or AP Lit. <laughs> I can tell you my favorite tragic heroes. I love tragic heroes, but my hubris was, and again, I could be interpreting this wrong, I just thought I was right. <laughs> I thought that anybody who didn't agree with me because I was so right wanted kids to die. One percent of the, no, I wouldn't say that. My guess is that three percent of the country doesn't care when kids die. Three percent just says, not my kid, or, you know, it's not where I am. But the rest of the country doesn't want kids to die. And, you know, I learned about that, <clears throat> that family in Texas where the mom and the dad both carry weapons because they want to protect their family. Mm -hmm. I learned about the people in, in everywhere who, who want to uh, protect their families. I have guns in my house, and while I believe in an assault weapons ban, or at least much more restrictive laws, if you want to hurt my autistic brother and I have a gun, you're in trouble. 
So when you see someone like David Hogg, and I'm only mentioning him because he's been so vocal, and you know I try to talk about ideas and not people, but when you see someone like him tweeting all of these things, but you know, I don't want to get an exact quote crossed up here, but to the, in the effect, if you don't agree with me, you want dead kids, Republicans want dead kids, Marco Rubio doesn't want to save anybody, all, all of these things, you now realize that's, just not the way to do that. That it's not true and it's not it's not actually effective. The reason I criticize myself and not my friends is because I know David. David is a dear friend of mine. I've known him for a couple of years, but I've only known him really well since the shooting. Mm -hmm. I had a class with him once. He was a nice guy. Everything David does, and I know we're not talking specifics, but I'll just use David as an example because much like everybody else in March for Our Lives, everything David does, he does because he wants the country to be a better place. He and I don't always see perfectly eye to eye on what exactly to do. But every time I see something he tweets that I don't like, and I, 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 look, I think about it and I say, I've spent hours with David. I've known him, I, I know him so incredibly well because we have this dark, tragic, terrible bond that was really created after the worst case scenario. But when David says something that I don't agree with, he's saying it because he doesn't want another kid to die. So, you know, messaging with everybody in the group is occasionally not really in sync. We agree, we disagree on things sometimes. But if I thought that people in March for Our Lives, like David or, or anyone, was in this for the wrong reasons, I would, be in, I would instantly call them out. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the case. Yeah, unfortunately the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and I, I don't want to smirch his intentions. Well, it's uh, funny, I, I, believe you, I believe you that his intentions are, are pure. I, of course I believe that. Dave is a guy who cares so deeply about the world around him and will do whatever it takes to make it a better place. But it's funny that you say the road to hell is paved with good intentions, because our summer tour where we went around advocating for more voter registration and more accessible voting around the country was called Road to Change. And there was a counter protester at one of our events that said, more like the road to hell. And I said, hey, that's not very nice. 